the first thing I want to do is introduce um, the people that you guys are going to be working with today during our plankton lab. Um, and then we'll do a little housekeeping items um, just to talk a little bit about Tampa Bay Watch, who we are. And then we'll get right into um, collecting our plankton sample and um, getting to look at plankton. Um, so my name is Katie Masterbrook. I'm the Director of Education here at Tampa Bay Watch. I'm joined with some of my um, education specialist here at Tampa Bay Watch. Uh, Audrey Mitchell is currently filming us. She might pan it around real quick so she can say a quick hello. Hello everyone. And then we also have Amy Rodenheffer. Oh, we're going to be collecting our sample today. Um, so we'll tune in with her in just a second when she begins collecting our plankton sample. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know who Tampa Bay Watch is, we are an environmental nonprofit um, whose mission is to focus on the restoration and the protection of the Tampa Bay Estuary. Um, we do that through scientific and educational programming, um, much like what you guys are joining us to do here today. Um, so typically we have school uh, students out here uh, on field trips and summer camp sessions, but today we're doing things a little bit differently and we're bringing our LinkedIn lab into your Organisms. That's a great response. We have Kelly with small animals. Nice. So small animals, microorganisms. Um, usually we hear a lot from our students things like it's whale food or we always get a shout out to SpongeBob SquarePants because of evil plankton um, on SpongeBob SquarePants. But those are all really good descriptive words that you guys are giving us. Keep participating throughout this. I know there is probably a little bit of a lag time. Um, but again, we'll get to your questions and your responses as they come in. Um, so what we're going to do now is talk about how we are going to collect our plankton um, sample. We do that by using what is known as a plankton toe net. Not like the toe on your foot, but in fact, we're actually talking about the technique because this net is actually towed through the water to collect our water sample that will have plankton in it. If we look at the net, it's designed that it has an opening on one end, it's a coned or funnel shaped, and then it goes down to the cod end of the net where a jar is going to collect our sample of water that we'll have after we throw it in the water and soak it for a minute or so, have a high concentration of plankton in that bottom of that jar. And that's because of the design of the net. Um, it has a lot to do with the fine mesh netting uh, and the small holes that are in here. So it does allow a little bit of water and plankton to escape, but for the most part, we're gonna get that nice concentrated sample of uh, plankton. So we're gonna pan over um, to Amy to take a closer look at the uh, technique 
of basically uh, collecting your plankton sample. Um, what she's doing right now is one of two techniques you can use. Um, you can throw it in the water like she's doing and then retrieve it. Um, but what you wanna make sure you're doing is always keeping that net up towards the surface of the water. Especially in a location like ours, this is a shallow body of water. Um, and if we let that net go all the way down to the bottom, we'd be collecting a lot of uh, sand and sediment today. And sand and sediment is really cool to look at underneath the microscope. Um, but with that being said, we're here today for the plankton, I do believe. So we're gonna give her a few minutes of just collecting that. Um, but some other things to think about while she's collecting a plankton sample has to do with, um, there's a lot of things that change what we actually see in the water. Um, things like a day like today, when it's really windy out and we've had some rain, that may change the concentration of plankton that we're gonna see in our collection today. The water is actually pretty, pretty clear in comparison today than it was yesterday. Um, so the turbidity is not as high. That basically means there's not as much suspended particles of sand in our water today. Um, but, you know, like I said, things change what we're gonna find in our net. But what's really cool about this lab is that every day when we do it, we see something different. And sometimes you don't even need a plankton tow net to actually um, see plankton in your water. You can just go take a scoop full of water in a jar and you're gonna get plankton in that uh, sample of water. However, it helps to have that filtration net so we have a nice concentrated sample. So I think uh, Amy's done a really great job of collecting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna head up to our classroom and talk a little bit more about plankton. While we're heading up there, I want you guys to um, give me a shout out about uh, what do you guys think we're gonna get ready to see when we get upstairs? I also wanna hear from you guys, have you ever done a plankton lab before? Uh, maybe with us here at Tampa Bay Watch or another partner organization who does similar environmental education programming. Or maybe you're just an at-home scientist who has your own microscope um, and tools to collect a plankton sample. Uh, or maybe this is your first time hearing about plankton. So. We have a lot of people just coming on right now. Okay. Courtney Likens is saying, good job, Amy, with your collection techniques. <laughs> yeah, so for those of you guys just joining us again, uh, my name is Katie, Audrey's on the camera, Amy uh, has our sample, um, and if you are just tuning in, uh, we've collected our sample, we went over our towing technique, um, and now we're heading into the classroom to take a closer look and learn about our plankton. So follow along with us, and we'll go ahead and get started. A lot of people are saying they are new to plankton and they're excited for this lab today. Awesome. Some are saying they've seen plankton at Crystal River before. Nice! We're excited to have you guys. Alright, just getting a quick drink of water. Alright guys, so welcome to our classroom. Again, thank you for joining us today. Um, I appreciate your guys' responses earlier about what plankton um, is, what some descriptive words you would use things like that, it was microscopic, small organisms, um, whale food, I threw in there, SpongeBob uh, SquarePants for the evil plankton. Um, but we're gonna just talk a little bit more in depth about plankton, um, and then we're gonna go ahead and look at that sample that Amy just collected for us so we can see all the cool things that are living in our estuary. So plankton is actually pretty simple as far as the definition goes. The word plankton comes from the Greek word planktos, and that actually just means to be a drifter or a wanderer. So what's cool about plankton is that it's any plant or animal um, that is in a marine environment that just goes with the flow. Um, so if we look at this picture right here, you may see that there are some squiggly lines in the water on this globe, and that's the driving force of our oceans. Um, so our plants and animals are plankton that are going with the flow they actually can't swim against what these squiggly lines are representing. Does anybody know, give a shout out of what these squiggly lines might be representing in the water here? Um, again, if our planktons have to go with the flow, it means that they're probably not strong enough to swim against these things here. Instead, they're just drifting along um, as plankton do. So if we don't have any responses, I'll give it another second to see if it We can... have currents oh, first very, from Georgia. Very good job, currents. So again, our plankton are plants and animals that have to go with the flow. They're typically not big enough, not strong. 
strong enough to swim against those currents that are out there in the ocean. Now, a lot of you guys told me, and I heard in the beginning, microscopic, teeny tiny, small. Um, and that is definitely true. Um, what we're going to be doing today is using a microscope. Um, so we're not going to be using these microscopes because you guys aren't with us today, but we're going to be using our more powerful microscope so that we can get a better view at our plankton that we caught. Um, so again, most of our plankton is microscopic, but that's not always the case. Sometimes our plankton can actually be pretty large. For example, this animal right here. Um, and so since we have kind of a slow delay time, I'm going to go ahead and yell out what animal this is, a jellyfish. Um, the species of jellyfish this is is a lion's mane jellyfish. But again, this is still considered plankton because it has to what? Go with the flow. Um, so most of our jellyfish, they are considered plankton. There are a few species out there that are strong enough to swim against the current. So no longer considered plankton, but for the most part, um, even some of those big jellyfish out there are what we consider plankton. Now, there are two types of plankton that we're gonna have the opportunity to see today. Um, I mentioned earlier that there is plant plankton and there is animal plankton. So I wanna hear from you guys, the more scientific names for these two groups, plant plankton and animal plankton, are what we call phytoplankton and zooplankton. So I want to hear from you guys. This first word I have up on the board is called phytoplankton. If you think it might be a plant plankton or an animal plankton. To give you some hints while we wait for responses, kind of look at that word and maybe see if the root of the word or if it sounds like something you've heard before and maybe your science class um, or, you know, wherever you may have heard this word before, but that might help you tell if it's a plant or an animal. Oh, we have Grayson who said plant. Very good, Grayson. It is a plant plankton. That word fight actually means plant. Um, so these are our plant planktons. So much like our plants on land, our plants that are in our um, ocean environments or in the water, they also have to make their energy from the sun. Um, they have to get their food from the sun. Does anybody know what that term is called? That might have helped you figure out that why phytoplankton might have been plant plankton. Again, it's how plants make their energy from the sun. I sure wish we could do that. Not that we could do it on a day like today with it being really cloudy out there. Um, but these are our plant plankton. Thank you guys for participating. We do have that lag time, but we're getting lots of great answers in there. So we I'm, have photosynthesis from job. Sherry. Good job. Said photosynthesis. Very good job. So again, our phytoplankton are plant plankton. They make their own energy from the sun, and that's called photosynthesis. So here is an example. I'm going to move this out of the way real quick of some of the ones that you may see today um, in our plankton sample. Please keep in mind that these are not all of the different types of phytoplankton found in our waters, but some of the most common ones. You can refer to that ID guide that we talked about earlier in this lesson in that Google Drive um, to give you some more types of phytoplankton. When we take a closer look at them, you might notice that they actually look a little bit like our land plants and the fact that they have um, some like characteristics. Things like they have spines coming off of them, similar to like thorns on our roses or plants that are on land. You may see that some of them are growing in chains. And some other things you might notice is that they all have this kind of greenish, goldish, yellow color, just like our land plants. And that has to do with because they have that chlorophyll or that chloroplast in them that helps them photosynthesize, helps them utilize the sunlight to make their food. Um, also, those spines and growing in chains, those are going to be things that help them in their natural environment. Things like defend themselves. I sure wouldn't want to eat something that has spines all over it. And growing in chains helps you share your resources with other liked plankton. Um, so these are some of the ones that we are going to be looking at uh, today underneath the microscope. Now, plant plankton, phytoplankton, a little bit harder to figure out. The next group are zooplankton. It's a little bit more obvious. The way that I remember it is when I go to the zoo, I go to the zoo to see all the animals. So this is going to be our animal plankton. So again, animals that have to go with the flow out there. They have to move where the currents are taking them. So our animals, unlike our plants, 
they don't get the, um, they don't have the ability to make their energy from the sun. They have to hunt and gather, um, just like we do. Um, so our zooplankton are actually eating other, typically, plankton that are out there in the water. Uh, when we take a closer look at these, you might say, hmm, Katie, these actually look familiar to me, like maybe some animals I know that live in our marine environments. Um, and that's because they are. These are actually just the juvenile or baby stages of these animals that you are probably pretty familiar with. So if we take a closer look, we'll start with this guy right here. It's called a zoea, which is one of my favorite runs to see underneath the microscope. Our zoea are actually just juvenile crustaceans. So things like you may have said, it looks like a shrimp or the beginning stages of a crab or a lobster. Um, so those are our zoea and hopefully we'll see one of those today. Some of my other favorite ones are like this guy right here. I'm sure we all know right off the bat what this one is, just by the way that it looks. It's called a hydroid medusa, and this is a juvenile version or life stage of our jellyfish. This guy right here, if we take a closer look, it's got this cool spiral looking shell on its back, kind of a good uh, giveaway, and it's called a villager larva. And this guy right here, if you haven't guessed it already, is an example of a sea snail. Um, so, they start off as plankton, teeny tiny, going with the flow, but some of our sea snails can get pretty monstrous. This is actually a shell um, from a horse conch, which happens to be our state shell, if anybody was curious. Um, so, they start off as plankton, but as they get larger and in adults, they're a lot bigger and stronger, and they can move against that current. And then... The most famous one of them all is this guy right here, known as a copepod. Um, the reason I bring this guy up is because if you're familiar with Evil Plankton from SpongeBob SquarePants, he is probably looking pretty familiar to you. And that's because Evil Plankton from SpongeBob was modeled after the copepod. You can see that one cycloptic eye right in the middle, that bulbous body, those two long antennas. And in fact, this is a female copepod that has eggs down by her side, so she's gravid. So we'll take a look and see if we find any copepods in our sample today. With that being said, copepods are the most abundant type of plankton we find in our sample every time we do this. We're almost always guaranteed to find a copepod, and that's because anywhere around the world, if we were going to take a sample of water and be looking for plankton, Again, it's the most abundant species that you're going to find. You're going to find usually some uh, species of plankton, uh, of copepod. So we'll keep our eyes out for him today. Now, what we're going to do now is, it's the, the final hour. It's time to look at uh, all Amy's hard work collecting that plankton for us. And we're going to see what we're going to see under the microscope. So when we do this, um, we're going to get ready to switch over and Miss Audrey is going to be done filming for just a little bit and she's going to help us identify some of the things that are on um, our projector screen here in just a second. With that being said, again, don't forget to follow along with your ID guide on the Google Drive. You can also, if you're working on those worksheets that are on that Google Drive, you can also um, you know, answer the questions and follow along. If you've missed an answer, feel free to ask us in the comment section and we'll try to answer one of the questions if you missed it, all right? So I'm gonna pass it over to Miss Audrey and we'll get started on looking at our plankton. All right, guys, I'm excited to explore with you that sample that Amy just went out and caught for us. So this is a live sample. So I'm going to be going over some of the stuff that I'm seeing, but also want you guys at home to look at our sample, talk to us, let us know what you guys want to talk about and what you are seeing. Just a reminder that we do have those ID guides that are linked in the description of this Facebook Live video, and they have just the common things that we are usually going to see. But there are thousands of different types of plankton. So we know a lot of these plankton that we usually see, but sometimes we're even surprised by the amazing biodiversity, lots of life that we get to see here in our estuary. So right behind us, we have a really exciting plankton that we actually don't get to see all the time. This is an arrowworm or a chitonap. And that name chitonap actually talks about the huge jaws on this marine worm. I know it doesn't look very scary, but this is actually a huge, amazing predator 
in our plankton world. So it's, it's very exciting that we get to see him today. Very cool. What else are we going to see? It looks like he might even have a copepod down in his belly. It looks a little full there. Yeah, he might have eaten something in our plankton sample. Got an easy meal. Woo, very cool, very active. So all of this that you are seeing in the background of that sample is detritus or sand or sediment. Like Katie was saying, it's not always beautiful in Florida and we have a little bit of wind and rain. That's why we have a little bit of that lag time. So we do have a lot of debris in that sample today. So you can see some of this circular plankton right there, those perfect round circles. Those are going to be called our coskino discus. So you can hear that term disc at the end. So they are perfect circles. And what's so cool about coskino discus is they are a type of phytoplankton called a diatom. And those diatoms of Coskino discus is the most abundant phytoplankton. It has over 500 species, which is really, really interesting. So they look like those pizzas, green pizzas, when they're flipped flat. But if you turn them on their side, they actually can look like hamburgers, which is pretty cool. So we have lots of little tiny zooplankton swimming around. That um, individual is probably a juvenile barnacle. He's swimming on his side. There's a lot of airworms today. We have a different worm right in the corner, right here. We have a bristle worm. So bristle worms, it's a little hard to see underneath that detritus, but those bristle worms are polychaete worms. So polychaete worms are segmented worms. And that term actually polychaeta refers to the hairs on their body. So maybe in a second, that polychaete worm, that bristle worm will open up and we'll get to see those bristles on its body. It uses those bristles for protection, but also just to move around. Ooh, it looks like we have a nice amphipod that just swam around. They can actually get really bright and colorful and red. Ooh, we have evil plankton from SpongeBob right there. We have our copepod. He's not doing evil things. They're stealing Krabby Patties, but he is here with us today. That copepod, like Katie said, is the most abundant zooplankton that we get not only here in our estuary, but you get copepods everywhere in the Arctic, the Antarctic, in your ponds, in your lakes. These individuals are everywhere. And you can see they modeled evil plankton from SpongeBob after that individual has the big antennas, that red cycloptic eye. You can also see we have, it looks like some kind of round, Tunicate. Oh, tunicate. Yeah. So right here, kind of stuck underneath that sand, is going to be the head or the main body of that tunicate, also known as a sea squirt. It's really active today. I think it's trying to get unstuck right now. And um, those sea squirts, they are very simple animals that are pretty sedentary. Um, they, when they're growing up, they're not going to be moving around as much. It looks like we have I can't tell if it's turned sideways and it's a Plutus larva or if it is going to be a different kind of phytoplankton, a dinoflagellate. So Paige was wondering what microscope we are using in order to get this up on our screen. Yeah, absolutely. If you actually wanted to follow me right over here, we can take a quick look at our microscope and the gear that we're using today. So we just have our plankton sample, just a little portion of it that Amy caught today. And then we have it on a nice projection screen. So it is hooked up to that projection right now. Yeah, and it's a KineVision model of microscope, um, but it's a pretty old model of it. So if you're looking to purchase one like this, I, I don't know if they still make this make and model. Thanks. But it is definitely more powerful of a microscope than we would use um, as far as the microscope I showed you guys yeah. earlier. So these are just stereoscopes. These are what we're normally looking at with our kids. So when we're doing this lab with our students um, during our field trip and summer camp programs, we are actually letting them use these microscopes and explore 
a sample on their own. So these are a little bit less powerful, but still just as useful. Very cool. So we'll spend just a, a minute or two more looking at our plankton sample. Hopefully we'll find something exciting for you guys to look at. Phil also wanted to know if we can see plankton in cold, fresh water. Yes, absolutely. Um, there is different types of plankton in all different sorts of water. So what you're going to be seeing in cold, fresh water isn't necessarily going to be the same as the plankton that we are seeing here in our sample straight from the estuary. So you'll find stuff in different salt versus fresh, but you will see plants and animals. Remember, plankton is just any plant or animal that is going with the flow, like Katie said. Wow, look at this really cool organism. We don't see these all the time. It is called a lancelet. Um, it's not being pretty active, but these are actually zooplankton, and they can be pretty active. Um, they are really neat because they actually have some kind of semblance of a nauticord or a simple backbone, which is pretty neat. Oh, it's moving a little bit for us. To get motion sickness, I apologize. <laughs> I'm doing my best to keep up with the plankton that yeah. might be on the screen. Katie's controlling our sample right now. Ooh, it looks like we have something down in the corner. It looks like a little hydroid. You can see those feeding tentacles Great. on that individual. Maybe an Might be like, oh, I don't know. Oh, it's flipping sideways. We have a copepod that's trying to cover it up right now. <laughs> Someone asked if the lancelet was deceased, but it just wasn't moving. No, it was alive. It just wasn't moving. It's just hanging out in our sample today. Awesome. So, cool. so we'll just pause in this, this area for just a second and see if anything kind of swims by. Give you guys a second to get your sea legs about you just so that we can see if anything else kind of comes across the screen. It's hard to keep up with all the different things that might, and that, yeah, it's pretty cool in the center there. The Neil wants to know, are these actual size or magnified by the telescope? Yes. So <laughs> these individuals are definitely magnified by our microscope that we're using today. But with that being said, if you were scooping up a sample of water, you would be able to see some of our larger plankton moving around. But to see some of the smaller ones, especially our phytoplankton, you would definitely need a microscope. I know a lot of people always ask us during this lab, is this what we're swallowing when we're out there and we accidentally swallow some ocean water? Um, and you know, something to think about is that these are microscopic organisms and um, it's okay if we've swallowed some ocean water before. Our stomachs are strong. We have strong acids in our stomach that break those guys down. But yes, this is a very concentrated sample of um, different animals and plants that are living right out in our estuary. Marta wants to know, did you guys find this in the oceans? We did. We collected this sample straight off property of Tampa Bay Watch in the Tampa Bay estuary. So the estuary, it is that special mixture of fresh and salt water. So we have a really special body of water um, that allows us to have all of this life. Oh, very cool. This is the plankton that I was talking about earlier. This is that Ploidus larva. It is a larva or a baby of one of our echinoderms. An echinoderm is a type of animal that has spiny skin and they usually have two feet or suction cups. Can you guys at home think of any animals that have suction cups and spiny skin? We'll give you a second to think of some of those animals. There's lots of different kinds. While we're giving them a second, do you mind if we show them the net? I think we had a few people that missed the beginning. Yeah. So, f so if you missed the beginning, um, we use this collection, this plankton toe net to get this concentrated sample right in our backyard, which again is the Tampa Bay Estuary. 
Um, so we wouldn't have gotten this concentrated of a sample if we didn't use this net. If we would have just went out and took like a scoop of water, there wouldn't be nearly this much life in it. So that's what the tow net is for, so we can get that um, good biodiversity and that concentration um, when we're trying to check out to see what's living in our water. Next. So Grayson answered our question and said that it is a starfish. Awesome. Good job. So our echinoderms are a large group of animals with their spiny skin and tube feet. But there's lots of different kinds. We have sea urchins, we have our sea stars, but also organisms like our sand dollars or our sea cucumbers. So it's a pretty large group. But most of them start off kind of looking like that individual that we just saw a moment ago. But that, because it has the really, really long projections, most likely is a juvenile sea urchin. But that's just a guess. Most likely, that's sea urchin. And this is a test of a sea urchin. Very cool. We're finding lots of biodiversity today. Courtney wants to know, what is the coolest thing you have seen in this lab? Ooh, that's a hard one because we get so many different things. I think my favorite are the juvenile jellies that we get pretty often. And then we have seen some really cool juvenile crabs and shrimp. I think the porcelain crab larva is my favorite. Ooh, you can see the top of one of those arrow worms that we were talking about earlier. You kind of see a smiley face, uh, those jaw-like appendages that Audrey was describing if you zoom in. But they look uncharacteristically like they're smiling, but they are considered the barracuda of the plankton world. They are, are good. Uh, hunters, and a lot of times you can see because they have that clear design um, food in their belly. Um, so a question to pose before we get to into this is, why are we seeing a lot of these zooplankton, especially having that kind of clear collar? How could that be helpful or beneficial uh, to them to have that clear oh, moving around. body? Mm -hmm. So our arrow worms, something cool about them too, is their jaws can actually project out of their mouths. So some people say they were the inspiration for those aliens from Alien vs. Predator because they have those jaws that can come out, which is pretty neat. Jennifer wants to know, what is the biggest thing we have seen? Um, me? How did the zodiac larvae? Yeah. So probably the shrimp and crab larva that we see. But a lot of our zooplankton, our animal plankton, when they start to get really, really large, they're no longer plankton because they can move against those currents. And Marta wants to know, have you guys ever seen a crab in the ocean? Yeah, we see lots of crabs. We get a lot of different crabs in our estuary. We get some of the more common ones are like our blue crabs. We get our horseshoe crabs, spider crabs, decorator crabs, lots of different crabs. And we definitely get to see some of them in their planktonic form. Very neat. So we'll look for maybe 30 more seconds and then um, we'll move on to why plankton is so important. Just a couple more seconds here, guys. See if we find any last cool things yeah. that we didn't identify. Neat. So in the background, you're probably seeing a couple lines in the back that are a little bit harder to focus in on. And like I mentioned, our phytoplankton, our plant plankton, often is a lot smaller than a lot of the animal plankton that we see. So those long straight lines that are green in the back are most likely our skeleton nema phytoplankton, which if you are looking at our ID guides, you can find right in that corner. So skeleton nema gets its name from the long shape. It kind of looks like a spine, which is really neat part of your skeleton. He's a cool bristle worm, but I lost him. Oh, I think he's there he right there. There's a very large bristle worm, that polychaete worm that we were talking about earlier. They use those bristles or hairs to move around. They also can use them as defense. So polychaete worms are those segmented worms that we get. Jennifer wants to know if plankton can be harmful. Absolutely. That's actually a really great question. So plankton, um, especially our phytoplankton, is naturally found out in our oceans. And when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're really beneficial. But sometimes 
when there's certain types of phytoplankton, they can uh, form harmful algae blooms. So many of you are probably familiar with red tide. Red tide is a harmful algae bloom that can happen by that organism, Corena brevis. So Corena brevis is a phytoplankton, it is single cell, it kind of looks like an acorn. It is a dinoflagellate. That means it has two little uh, tails that can help it move around the water, so it can actually move, which is pretty cool. But even though we have it around here all the time, and it is natural, when it does decide to reproduce and has the right conditions, then it can do those harmful algae blooms. Um, and Corona brevis in particular has a brevotoxin. That brevotoxin is actually what can um, be harmful for a lot of those organisms like our manatees, our sea turtles, um, and even some of our fish. We had that event, I believe, in 2018 um, with that red tide. So they can be harmful, but not all the time. Good question. All right, I think it's about time for us to get wrapped up today. I hope you guys really enjoyed seeing all that biodiversity. So lots of different life today. And we're going to talk a little bit about why plankton is so important. So yes, it's really fun to look at and interesting, but it's also very, very important. So we're going to talk a little bit about their importance today. So I just pulled up a picture. Does anyone know what this picture is representing? I'll give you guys a moment. Amy's going to zoom in on that picture so you can get a closer look. Jennifer wants to know, do fish eat plankton? They do. That's actually what we are about to talk about. So if you guessed our marine food webs, then you are correct. So this is a picture of our marine food web. A marine food web are multiple food chains kind of put together and it shows a better picture of what our animals are actually eating. So if this is showing what we're eating, you can see there's a fish right here and they are actually um, going to be eating some of that plankton. So let's take a peek at our marine food web. At the very bottom right here, you can see our phytoplankton and then you'll see our zooplankton. At the very bottom of our marine food web, we call that the foundation. So maybe you've heard of that term foundation on the foundation of your house or the foundation of your school. The foundation is the very bottom. What would happen if we took the foundation away from maybe your house or away from your school? What would happen if we took away that foundation? I still think we have a little bit of lag time, but if you guessed, that everything would fall apart, then you're right. If we took away the foundation of our marine food web, it would essentially collapse. Even organisms like our apex predators, right up here we have our shark, wouldn't be able to eat the things that it normally eats. So looking at our apex predator, our shark, if you go down, maybe that shark is eating a large fish, that large fish is eating a smaller fish, and that smaller fish is eating zooplankton, which our zooplankton might eat that phytoplankton. So everything is connected. If one thing goes out of balance, it can affect the whole system. So plankton is extremely important as a food source. I'm gonna pull up in just a moment a couple of our really, really large animals that eat our plankton. All right, so I just pulled up one of the largest animals in our oceans, and not just in our oceans, but in the world. This is the largest animal that has ever existed. Does anyone know what animal this is? This animal can get over a hundred, well, up to a hundred feet, and is the largest animal that has ever existed. Are we getting any answers in? We're getting some questions. Courtney says it is a whale. It is a whale. It is a blue whale. Our blue whale, they eat krill and they can eat up to around like 40 tons of krill per day, which is crazy. This is one of our largest turtles. We have a leatherback turtle and that leatherback turtle eats jellyfish. We have our largest fish, which is a whale shark. And then we have our largest ray, which is a manta ray. So these organisms are some of the largest animals in their category, and they're eating some of the smallest things. Our plankton give them lots of energy, and they're able to get a lot of it. 
So plankton is important as a food source. The second reason our plankton are so important is for something that you guys are doing right now and every day. Plankton is important for our oxygen production. So our plankton, our phytoplankton, they give us over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. Over 50%. Some scientists think it's even upwards towards 70 or 80%. That's more than the rainforest. The rainforest only gives us about 20% of the oxygen that we breathe. So without our plankton, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do in our everyday life. All right. So now that we've talked about why plankton is so important, I want to just talk really, really quickly about some of the challenges our plankton is facing. So some of the threats of our plankton. So one of the threats our plankton face are microplastics. Maybe you've heard of that term microplastic. It's becoming a little bit more trendy and more people are actually starting to learn about our microplastics. Microplastics are teeny tiny plastics that are five millimeters. So five millimeters or less. So these microplastics are getting into our oceans and they're actually being found on every level of our uh, marine food web that we were just talking about. So plankton, this video right here, is actually a video of our copepod eating some pieces of plastic. So all those little green beads are microplastics. So scientists are finding that they are actually getting into our oceans and being consumed and having some negative effects, especially because those plastics can have a lot of harmful chemicals and toxins in them. So not only are they being found on our planktonic level, but they're being found on every single level of that marine food web that we were just talking about. So microplastics is definitely a threat that we are starting to see. And then I always like to end on some plankton solutions, some things that you guys can do at home to help out. So I'm going to actually give a pause and I want to hear from you guys. What are some things that you can do at home to help protect our plankton and our oceans in general. I'll give you a hint. There's some pictures on our board that might give you the answer. Take a moment. There's a lot of different things that you guys can do at home. Recycle from Erin. Recycling from Georgia. Perfect guys. So I'm glad that you said that. Reduce, reuse, recycle, those three R's, and you can even refuse, which is say no to some of those plastics. So you guys are really smart, and we want you guys to remember that the land and sea, no matter where you are, work all connected. So thank you guys for tuning in to our Plankton Lab. But before we go, I want to open the floor to some questions. So if there's any questions that you did not get answered today, go ahead and write those in the comments. And then if we don't get a chance to answer those, we'll try to go back later at the end of our video and answer those in the comments as well. So um, while we are waiting for some of those to come in, we'll take a trip to the back of the classroom. Our first question was, what is a favorite animal that we've ever collected before? Hmm, that's a hard one because we collect a lot of organisms when we're doing different labs with our students. So in our plankton lab, I think my favorite are jellyfish and then we get a lot of different crab and shrimp species. But if we're talking about larger animals, um, we get some really interesting um, fish species as well out in our estuary. Two other questions we've got is how can you re uh, reduce the amount of microplastics? in our oceans That's and the second question just so i don't forget it because they've asked a couple different times is how do plankton breathe okay <laughs> so i'll go ahead and answer how do plankton breathe is it all depends on what kind of plankton that they are so plankton is any plant or animal that drift in our oceans so some of those um, plants are just going to be doing a gas a very simple gas exchange you know taking in that carbon dioxide and then letting out that oxygen. 
that different animals, it, de it just depends. A lot of our um, juvenile like fish species, they have their gills. Some will do gas exchange across their uh, membranes. So it, it's a pretty complex answer, but that's a really great, great question. And then going back to the microplastics question, is you guys can reduce your microplastics by just getting rid of some of those plastics in your life. So using those reusable bags when you go to the grocery store instead of the plastic bags, or using a reusable water bottle instead of buying those plastic water bottles from the grocery store. A really um, great one also is a lot of people don't realize that there are microplastics in a lot of the like face wash that you can buy. So make sure that you are checking the ingredients on the back of some of those face, face wash products, especially the ones with the exfoliants, and make sure they don't have things like polyethylene um, in them. And a reminder for everybody who was asking what plant plankton was called again, that is phytoplankton. So remember that word fight means plant, and plankton means going with the flow. They're drifters and wanders. So we're getting ready to tune out, but um, Audrey has one last message for us. Yes. So before we leave, I just wanted to mention that we are so thankful for everyone who tuned in today, and we hope you tune in next week, Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern Time to meet Mr. Palm. So Palm is an ornate diamondback terrapin turtle and our unofficial mascot here at Tampa Bay Watch. So if you have questions about this turtle, please hold them because we have a question and answer session uh, next week. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Check back to our Facebook and social media for any upcoming videos and live sessions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.